Yes, this conference will now yes. be recorded. Okay. Um, so, uh, anyway, to tell those who are just uh, getting onto the recording or listening to it, um, we want to talk about the effect of uh, the lockdown on kids in Connecticut, particularly in middle schools, where kids are just learning to become a little more independent and spend more time with their peers, which obviously hasn't been happening. <clears throat> so today we invited uh, two people, one who I've worked with uh, before, um, and that's Connecticut School Counselor Association Executive Director <clears throat> and Chair of the Cheshire High School Gardens Department, Michelle Catucci. We very much appreciate you being here, Michelle. Happy um, to be here. <laughs> excuse me. I'm I'm, of course, getting phone calls right in the middle of this. Uh, I hope it's not from uh, Jocelyn. Um, Jocelyn, who, uh, Mackie, who is the other person and may uh, be trying to get in touch with us, is SDE's Administrator for School Psychological Services and Primary Mental Health. That's Jocelyn Mackie. But let's start with uh, Michelle. Um, as always, there's room for, uh, for your questions, both as we go forward, as well as in the chat room. So, Michelle, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, let's start talking. Excellent. Thank you all for allowing me to be here today and to speak with you. Um, as Bob said, I'm Michelle Catusi. I'm the executive director for the Connecticut School Counselor Association. So we represent school counselors in the state of Connecticut. Um, which you, some of you may be familiar with the term guidance counselor um, that is used in some districts still, but school counselor is the certification and, and that is um, the term that, that we try to, to push forward um, people using going into schools. Um, the other support services roles that are in schools are school social workers um, and school psychologists, and there is some overlap among our roles, but we definitely also have um, some you know unique uh, pieces of our positions um, within schools. What so all three roles are important, and I think especially in talking about social emotional learning, clearly I think we all know that that's very important for our students um, of all grade levels. Um, but and we put programming in place. But my plug for <laughs> since I'm speaking to <laughs> to school boards right now, right, is that there need to be people in place for those programs to be successful as well. So having school counselors, school social workers, and school psychologists available in schools for all students um, at appropriate ratios, right, to uh, be able to deliver those programs with fidelity. So I was really glad that Bob had reached out um, to talk more about this. Um, over the last three months, while we've been dealing with remote learning, the Connecticut School Counselor Association has been very diligently providing professional development to school counselors. Um, a lot of conversations like this, right, that start off as kind of like a roundtable discussion, an opportunity to ask questions. Um, but we've also done some like more formal uh, professional development on um, talking about reentry, talking about telehealth um, and telecounseling, since that's something that school districts were doing, um, and really asking questions about what school counselors need to support their students in schools. And we did a lot of that work by level. And of course, we saw common themes um, among <laughs> all grade levels, well as elementary, middle, or high. Um, and student engagement was a, a huge piece of that. But I think specific to this middle school population, as Bob and he shared the NPR um, recordings with me as well, but as were highlighted is the students at the middle level are in such a unique position because they're in that that phase of self-discovery and independence. Um, you know, we encourage parents to back off a little bit in middle school to kind of let them get their feet wet um, in middle school trying out that independence on their own so that by the time they're getting to that high school and the post-secondary um, part of their education that they do have some of that that independence and resiliency built up from you know trying and maybe you know failing a little bit in middle school um, and certainly doing things remotely has, has made that a challenge I think for students and teachers and parents um, because parents have really had to step up to take a more active role in 
in their ch child's education, making sure they're getting out of bed in the morning and those types of things. Um, but I do think the other concern that that has come up is certainly that that socialization piece that while we have been able to provide instruction to students in some capacity through remote learning, that those other pieces um, that are taught through socialization, doing group work, um, you know, talking to um, a friend in class, like having that little like banter and conversation beforehand and some of that socialization and the social skills, you know, that we have nonverbal cues. You know, I see even in this meeting, which is totally fine, a lot of people choose to have their camera off. Um, and so you don't have that face to face interaction like you would have if you are, are with people <laughs> in the same room as we traditionally are in school. Um, so we really have been trying to help school counselors, support school counselors with ways to just really up that student engagement and getting them um, providing them with resources to be able to to support their students in that way um, and that has been a challenge depending on the school district that you work in i am fortunate so as bob mentioned i am the department chair for school counseling at cheshire high school and cheshire thankfully um, we were allowed to use the online platform to to communicate with our students from a counseling perspective at first it was a no camera um, um, communication just for confidentiality reasons, but once we got guidance from the state about confidentiality and, and worked out things on our end, um, you know, through the district, we were able to have these face-to-face -face conversations and still do things like group counseling with, of course, you know, parent, um, you know, um, consent and things like that. But that really changed the dynamic, um, I think, for me and, and for other school counselors when we were able to see our students face-to-face -face and still have them interact um, in different ways remotely so that they, you know, were seeing each other. Sometimes a group counseling session where in person, um, we might be working on like a specific, maybe like a mindful strategy or a social skills communication strategy. Um, sometimes just being able to have the kids interact with each other <laughs> was the lesson in itself because they weren't used to doing that anymore. I think even as adults, we can understand um, how this has changed our, the way we interact with people. I know now that, you know, some of the, the social distancing um, guidelines have, you know, gone away and we are interacting with people more in public like that I just even and I think I have very good social skills, but it's like, oh, it's weird being around people again. Right. So imagine how difficult that would be for um, a preteen or a teenager who's still trying to develop those skills um, as well. So, you know, I think that that as we are moving forward and I am, as all of you are, very anxious to hear what type of reentry plan we will have. But if we are remote in some capacity, I do think that um, thinking about the social emotional piece definitely is something that we need to consider how that will look remotely. But even if we do go back to in person, it can't be business as usual, right? Like we can't just be expected to have those kids jump back into being in a classroom um, and navigating that world again as they were, you know, in February of this past year, whenever things were, were normal. Um, so I think that having opportunities for social emotional learning training for staff is very important um, so that we're prepared to help our students best, regardless of what setting that we're in and some flexibility that, you know, the opening of school this year will look very different than it would any other year because we need to address a lot of the things that we've gone through. I think that it, it seems interesting to say it this way, but we're almost going through a, a trauma right now as a society. And there's so much work that's being done out there and so many districts have started doing work on trauma-informed um, schools and, and trauma-informed practices that I do think that that's something that if staff does not have a comfort level with that work, that that would be important for staff to understand as well. Um, because we do need to approach, we are coming back from something that none of us have experienced before. And while that may not look like trauma in like the sense that we're used to thinking about it, it definitely is a disruption to our lives um, and so staff have to be able to process their feelings about that and then working with students um, how our feelings um, you know can impact our students and how we can support and help them as well and again I keep parents as part of that conversation too because that's definitely the the trifecta of the school working with the students and the parents um, together so I'll stop there. I don't know if Jocelyn got on the call yet or not. I don't want to take up all, all of the time, but of course I can just keep talking on and on. <laughs> yes, can you hear me? So good to see you, Jocelyn. I already introduced <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> and I guess my question for you, Jocelyn, um, 
first of all, breathe. It's okay. We've all had trouble getting on a Zoom call um, <laughs> at one time or another. But um, tell me what you are hearing as you're sitting in your more of a statewide role at SDE. What are you hearing about what we're going to have to do to ensure that the kids and our staff have the social emotional help they will need as we go back to school? I mean, there's certainly a conversation around um, specific ways that we might be able to uh, provide assistance. Um, I had a conversation yesterday, actually, with my bureau chief, John Frasinelli, and uh, one of the things we discussed <coughs> is how we might be able to um, actually begin to provide some PD uh, to districts around social emotional uh, functioning uh, for students. Um, we also talked about, you know, some of the existing kinds of supports that we have. You know, we have several grants that are in effect. We have our, you know, Project AWARE grant that focuses on social emotional functioning. Um, we have our primary mental health program that primarily focuses on um, K through three, but also older uh, students can participate up to grade six, you know, for that. Um, and then I also, I manage the um, school-based diversion initiative. And that work really focuses on um, certainly reducing school-based arrests, but also thinking in terms of what kinds of uh, social emotional supports, early screenings that can take place to support students. So one of the things I can say is that um, the State Department has made social emotional functioning a priority. And you're gonna find when you um, look at the, the um, return to school document that will be coming out soon, you'll notice that that's an integral part um, of that document. So it's high, it's on our radar, and it's definitely something that we're very uh, committed to providing districts assistance with. Um, I'd like to talk more about professional development for, for uh, teachers and, and school staff in general. Patrice, you serve as you know, on the social emotional, uh, the task force on social emotional learning. Um, can you talk about what the task force is doing? And I know you had a discussion about PD yesterday or the day before. Can you talk about that too, please? Sure. Uh, earlier this week when we met, uh, the members of the collaborative were once again able to share what they are doing to support their school districts and um, make sure that we are focusing on the social emotional needs, not just of our students, but of our staff when school resumes uh, in September. One of the suggestions I made was that if the state were to suspend or waive for one year all of the very specific professional development mandates, that would allow school districts to use that precious professional development time and focus on the real priorities, social emotional learning, better support uh, for teachers that need help with distance learning, and also the issues of racial disparities. So I am hope there were two legislators on the call. Um, one of them asked for some specific recommendations. My specific recommendation is a blanket waiver rather than getting into, because everyone has their, their um, professional development requirement that they feel most strongly about, but I think we all feel strongly uh, about supporting these priorities for our students and staff in September. What do you, um, and I'll address this to Michelle and Jocelyn and Patrice, you know, you can always chime in. Um, what about students who are either in urban, I guess there are some suburban, and also rural districts which, who have been cut off during these last few months. They may not be able to get internet. Uh, they may not have computers. Um, where, where, what do you see happening with them uh, when they start coming back and how can we help them? Yeah, you know, I, I think that, that that's a, an ongoing challenge for sure and something that even going into remote learning, everyone was very concerned about is the, the equity piece of all of this. Um, you know, I think that 
in, in my experience um, and in talking with other counselors, you know, the, the concern is that right now we are very limited in the way that we can interact with students since it is remote. You can't show up at their house because, you know, um, the social distancing piece of it. But I think that that concern, it, especially coming back, is for those students who have been disengaged, whether that was by choice or by circumstance, um, there clearly are going to be learning gaps there on top of any summer slide that might have happened anyhow. Um, so how do we address those, those concerns? And I think that that, you know, the, the answer is not to, to hold all of those students back, but rather figure out ways in the systems that we already had in place in our schools um, to address those students that are, you know, most most in need and then providing interventions for those students, um, whether that's through an academic like SRBI team or a social emotional SRBI team, um, but then figuring out how we can meet those students where they're at and help them progress forward to be able to graduate um, or move on to the next school, you know, on the timeline that they would still be on. I don't think I have the answer to that question, aside from the fact that school districts just need to be diligent in identifying who those students are um, and then figuring out a way that you can reach out and communicate with them uh, that obviously fits within the realm of the, the rules and the guidance that we have from the state. Jocelyn, you want to? Sure, yeah. and I would definitely um, agree with that. Yeah, I, I really think it begins with understanding uh, the communities um, that have been most affected. And that means really opening up a dialogue and um, a, a way, a means of communicating with our families. Um, ensuring that uh, they recognize uh, that there is this level of uh, respect and, and willingness to support uh, and understand the culture of the families. Um, I, you know, with my background being in school psychology, you know, I, I certainly think in terms of assessment, we know that uh, many of these students have lost uh, ground over time uh, for a number of reasons. Maybe they didn't have immediate access to uh, computers or, or Wi-Fi, or maybe it was uh, not consistent access to it. And so that means that um, students in particular who perhaps may not have been doing as well or functioning optimally from the beginning have actually lost even more ground over time. And so I think one of the first steps um, would, uh, in, amongst the first steps I'd say, would involve really getting a handle on where students are academically, what, what are the losses, and then thinking in terms of what are the most appropriate ways to really intervene to provide the kind of support that they're going to need. And I think that's going to mean thinking outside of the box. You know, I think instruction is going to have to change a bit. Um, uh, SRBI was mentioned. You know, so we're going to need to try to find out where students are in terms of their, their present functioning. Um, and then pulling in our support staff, like our school psychologists, for instance, who can provide some assistance in terms of uh, really engaging in some progress monitoring regarding um, their academic functioning. Um, along with the academic function, I think we need to think about the social emotional component as well. Um, there are going to be some losses there also, and there may be some students who will return to school and think, you know, things were a little bit lax over the last few months. I didn't really have to be, you know, present uh, because the teacher wasn't standing over me. Can I come back to school and engage in similar kinds of behaviors? So we may run into some situations where there could be some behavioral concerns. Um, so I think staff are going to have to um, really grapple with how they're going to rethink the way they're providing instruction and also rethink what will be the most appropriate way to really gradually transition students back into an environment where there may be more uh, more required out of them than has been required uh, perhaps uh, or mandated over the last few months. Okay, are, you, are uh, either of you seeing any districts that are really getting ahead of these issues and have been planning uh, exactly what they're gonna do in this area when, when schools reopen? say not to my knowledge so far I think that a lot of conversations have happened but as far as anyone having a, a plan we've been waiting just to kind of see what guidance is coming out before really moving ahead with a re-entry plan but I know many districts are, are forming those committees and that the social emotional piece is, is certainly um, a topic for conversation on those committees so I would agree. I really haven't received any specific information from districts in that regard. Um, I will say, though, interestingly enough, um, I have heard from some of the um, alternative education uh, districts 
who um, already have some flexibility in terms of how they're providing instruction, um, they've actually indicated that some of their students have really taken very well to uh, the distance learning. Um, and these are students who perhaps um, weren't very comfortable being in the school environment. And so uh, I know some of those districts are thinking in terms of how we can continue to maintain some of the activities that we've actually uh, engaged in over this period. So there have been some lessons learned uh, in, in spite of what has really been a challenging period. That's great. Any any of our uh, attendees want to talk about um, what they're doing in their districts that might be helpful, Liz? Uh, hi, uh, this is this is a great conversation. I just want to speak to the idea of the disconnected youth in Waterbury. We had over 25% of the kids, especially middle and high school students, who were really disconnected from the whole experience. Uh, so uh, I, I've just recently found out that Hartford and New Haven actually have, have a contract with a nonprofit in their community that is, that is hired now to do all that outreach. So that may, I think that's a great idea uh, to have a community-based organization uh, trying to reach out to all these students. So I thought that was a really uh, good idea. In Waterbury, we have partnered with in an ad hoc way in one neighborhood uh, in the south end of Waterbury. Uh, uh, we had uh, uh, an organization going door to door, knocking on doors, and they came up with over 52 students that needed uh, Chromebooks and so forth. And then nonprofit was able to deliver them uh, with through the uh, partnership with the school district. So those are the kinds of, I think, Community support and community involvement in reaching students is critical. The schools cannot do it on their own. John? Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Michelle and Jocelyn. This is a great topic. Um, I'm thinking in ter organizationally in terms of these large, for the most part, spaces where there are lots of actors, players, participants. Typically, if uh, what are your thoughts about engaging with students directly to provide a level of autonomy um, to reach a shared understanding and a shared experience about here's what it's going it's it, here's what it has to look like in the next week or two i can't imagine with the re-entry that even in a couple of days everything will go back to normal my understanding is there's got to be some level of group process um, probably for the first week or two and I think to the extent that the children themselves can be major participants respectfully in that process, we probably will make greater advances. What do you think about that? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with you. Um, I had the opportunity to participate in a student voice um, webinar that the State Department of Education put on. Um, with one of my students from Cheshire, but then uh, we had students from, I think it was Waterbury, Meriden, um, Lebanon, Fairfield, and I'm going to forget the sixth, <laughs> the, the sixth area um, that we've covered, but it was very interesting from the, to hear the student voice and how they thought it was going, because I think some of the things that we thought were going well, um, they struggled with, and then some of the things we thought maybe we weren't being very successful on that the students really liked. And I think that one of the, the messages that came through loud and clear was that, um, it, I mean, it was different you know, between the individual, obviously different between districts, um, but that students have really, really good ideas and really good insight to how this is um, impacting them. Um, and so certainly, I, you know, I think that to hear their voice as part of the reentry would be very important and, and to take time to talk about this at the beginning of the school year that, you know, I think about our students that are going to be in transition, um, you know, whether it's transitioning from elementary to high school, um, to middle school or from middle to high school, um, you know, we do so much to support those students in the transition in the spring and then in the fall or the summer um, in that transition and that stuff hasn't happened. So I feel like we, you know, 
need to, to figure out for those groups that would naturally be transitioning to something different, how we can support them through that, what that might look like. Um, you know, and that brings up like security concerns too. Like we were talking about in one of the middle school meetings that wouldn't it be great to then do a virtual tour of the high school um, for those students and have that somewhere. But then you are bringing in a, to the virtual world, the blueprint, the map to your school for someone who might not, <laughs> might not actually be going there. So that, you know, maybe that's not the best solution. It's there are so many, you know, different pieces to follow. But I think that, you know, going, going back that we we need to this will be a transition for everyone this transition back to you know whatever um hybrid or or you know being in school full time whatever it might be where in the spring when this happened students had already maintained or you know developed those relationships with their teachers with social supports with their administrators they knew what the rules were and the expectations and we don't have that luxury going into the fall with new teachers you know new classroom makeups um and things like that so i think we we need to be creative and we need to talk to our students about what that might look like right thank you jocelyn did you want to add anything I'll just, I, I think Michelle really said it all, but I will add just a bit here. Um, I actually had an opportunity to observe that that webinar. I believe it's the same one, Michelle, that you're referring to uh, with student uh -huh. voices. And I actually jotted down some of their comments. So I'll, I'll just share some of those. They actually, and, and this is around the issue of challenges that they felt they were experiencing. And they said um, one challenge was missing out on group activities. Um, another was being, being social with everyone is an important part of learning and you can't get this with distance learning. Um, they said, my favorite part of class is solving problems with peers. So they're really missing out on that opportunity to, to be with peers. They said, trying to learn new concepts without the teacher being there to respond is a challenge. And the last one I'll share is um, they said a lack of support from classmates in the classroom setting is challenging. So they really, um, they really are feeling that loss. Um, and you know, we're talking about middle school students, so we know how important it is for them to begin to develop their own sense of self-identity and you know, moving away from uh, parents and families at home and, and really connecting with their peers. And I think that that was really clearly uh, expressed in many of the comments that they shared during that Student Voices uh, webinar. Thank you. Great, further questions? Well, I have one. I, I haven't really formulated it in the way that I, I like to, but there's been so much on TV these days about the civil justice protests, uh, Black Lives Matter, other issues like that. <clears throat> and obviously there have been many protests. Kids have seen the horrible slaying of George Floyd what is the impact on top of everything else, on top of the COVID uh, issue that that seemed like, well, we were going to really have to um, help kids with, you know, a month, a month and a half ago. With so much on TV, so much violence, what, where does that fit in with everything else we're trying to do and bring kids back? You know, I think um, I think we're really grappling with um, two very historic events, and they're certainly um, uh, they're certainly you know demanding a lot of our attention. Um, I I think it's important for us to think in terms of um, how we might be able to assist students in sort of um, understanding uh, these events. And, uh, you know, even as adults, we have difficulty with that. Um, so I really think it's going to involve not only um, each of us personally thinking about, uh, you know, how we feel about um, the, the recent events, um, but also learning how we might best be able to, um, to engage students in conversation about it. And so that may involve some uh, PD uh, that should take place. Um, I think pre pretending with students like it's not something that exists isn't going to work. I think that will definitely um, create more uh, issues of concern. Um, so, you know, students are, you know, more advanced than we tend to, to recognize sometimes. 
Um, and even uh, students who aren't really talking about the, the issues um, are hearing about it. You know, they're picking up on it through the media. They're, you know, they're learning about it through overhearing conversations, you know, or whispers from adults. And one of the worst things we can do was pretend like this isn't impacting their lives and that they're not equipped uh, cognitively to be able to really engage in conversations about it. Uh, so I think it's going to be a collective uh, effort uh, in, uh, in supporting students in their understanding of, of these events. Yeah, I think Jocelyn said that so well, but it definitely is something that it will need to be addressed in our schools. And I know as everything was, you know, unfolding and happening in, in my own building, we were having conversations about how, I mean, we wish we were with our students the whole time, but even more so, you know, in light of everything that was going on, we wish we were with our kids so we could talk with them about this and process it together. And, and you know, um, I think, it, one thing that certainly our, our our youth have shown is that they are listening, you know, especially over these last few weeks, they are listening, they do have questions, they want to engage in conversation and, and you know, put the, the optimistic spin on it, they want to make our world a better place and actually, you know, not just breeze over injustice, but talk about it and figure out ways to fix it. Um, so I think that that will definitely have to be part of the fold of, of what we're, you know, bringing into schools and, and talking with our students ab about at all levels, um, you know, that it will be handled in different ways, whether it's elementary, middle or high school, but at all levels, those are important conversations to have. Bob, hey. if I could. Sure, Don. Uh, Michelle, Jocelyn, this is Don Harris calling. Um, and I'm in the... <laughs> sometimes unenviable position of hearing uh, Kate. Um, and I thank you for this conversation about children. Uh, but I have a concern. You know, we're talking about all this professional development. Uh, we want to give staff to deal with uh, issues that children are facing. Um, I'm wondering if we are overlooking or not paying attention to issues that staff are having with this uh, Black Lives Matter, COVID-19. Uh, I, I, I know for a fact, you know, I, and I'm an old guy, I've been around a long time and I've experienced a lot of stuff, but I know for a fact that I've got board members, people that look like me are really struggling uh, with issues of what's going on out there in the world. And, uh, and if the board members are struggling, I can't help but think that the teachers in turn are struggling. Now, we don't have a heck of a lot of teachers of color out there, but they are the ones that are impacted. I want to, I want to say more than than we may realize. And they're the ones that have to, they're sitting on the front lines with these kids every day. Um, and it's it's not a pretty situation from any, uh, any way, shape or form. So uh, has any of your thoughts uh, been on this teaching staff or the administrators who have to deal with these kids? when they are going through the very same issues that the kids may be going through. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I, what you're saying is making a lot of sense to me, actually, in a, a lot of conversations that I've had, again, so my dual roles, right, with school counselors across the state, um, is that th one of the things they really liked that we were doing through the last three months was just offering a space for them to talk and support or talk with and support one another. And sometimes that was just sharing, you know, our strategies of, of self care and think we did a bunch of meditations, you know, <laughs> that, that people could view and things like that, because it, this is a stressful time for staff as well. Um, and then in talking in my, my own building, it, particularly with my administrators, you know, I, I feel like that's always been a, a focus um, with my administrators is making sure that the staff is okay, because, you know, and for, it's like the idea right on the, the airplane that you have to put on your mask before 
before you can, can help um, a child, right? That we need to be kind of checking. And I think even things like checking in on our own biases and our own experiences um, and, and really taking a critical look at that before we can, can do the work to, you know, do that work with students is definitely part of it. Um, and I, I know, like I said, a lot of like thought processes are going out there again with school counselors specifically, we have been doing our best to offer support um, in the form of having kind of these round tables for people to come together and talk and share ideas and then, you know, can make connections and follow up one on one. I can't speak if, if all teachers are getting that same type of support from their professional organizations as well. Um, but I do see some of that starting to happen in school districts um, and at least in my conversation with people that that is part of the conversation of how can we help our staff in addition to how can we help our students. And I'll just add um, that um, clearly self-care is a really important topic. Um, and just recently, I um, held a, a webinar um, that included representatives from school psychology, social work, and counseling. So it was basically a panel of individuals. Uh, and the whole purpose was to talk about um, you know, the importance of self-care, so really raising it to the level of awareness, um, and then thinking in terms of how we can best go about uh, providing self-care um, for ourselves. So that that webinar uh, was videoed and it is going to be posted on the State Department of Education's website uh, very shortly, I would say probably in a week. And it's also going to be accessible via YouTube. So I think it will be important to hear what um, some of our support specialists are saying about um, how things are impacting them in terms of the traumatic events that have occurred uh, over time. And then also so um, hearing what their thoughts are about how they are actually taking care of themselves and what advice they're providing to their colleagues in that regard also. And just to, to piggyback on that really quick, I think that if, you know, I'm just, again, thinking about the audience I'm speaking to, if you're if you're looking for good ways to have foster that conversation, a lot of the work that's done through restorative justice and the idea of talking in circles and things like that is actually a very, I think, productive way for people to have these types of conversations that are difficult to have. Um, so I, I, the State Department has put out some some great resources on restorative justice with Joanne Freiberg and everything like that. If, if you if you don't know her work already um, around that, but I do think that if that's something that if you're looking to bring something to your district and it might be things they're already doing, but to talk in that language about having these restorative circles to address some of these issues, I think especially when we're talking about racism and anti-racism and things like that, that can be a very difficult conversation for people to have. But the circle structure really does does provide a safe space to have that conversation in and to make sure that everyone feels like their voice is being heard. So even though it's a difficult conversation to have and hard work, it's a good structure to have in place to have those conversations, um, that that might be one route um, to, to investigate moving forward. So Bob, can I follow up with a real quick question? I'm sorry. Um, it just strikes me that what on earth could our next school year look like and the, I'm not a race car or a racing enthusiast, but the image pops into my head that on a racetrack called a Daytona, it's strewn with broken glass and nails, but you're gonna have a race on this racetrack. So we have so much to do that has everything and little to do with teaching and learning. What is next school year gonna look like? Great question. Nobody has the answer. <laughs> You can listen at four o'clock to hear what the governor and the commissioner. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> um, the thing, on the same thing of the, we talked about teachers, we talked about the students. We also want to talk about the parents too. Oh my oh, God. You, you want them to, you know, to be a part of the process and they're informed of what's going to happen with the students and the staff. And so it's, uh, you know, that the, the students are getting a, a message that's consistent or the opportunity to have a, consist uh, a, uh, a consistent message. Leonard, I saw your hand up there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I was just Good. waving to say hello. Oh. <laughs> I, was, I was actually waving to say hello too, but I'll take this opportunity to just, just speak. It is, um, we have, our children have been traumatized. 
I, as a sport, yeah. as a board member, I have been traumatized. I, I, I said we had a discussion at our last uh, at our last board meeting about the, the students who gave a, a presentation on the N word, and board members chimed in. But out here in Manchester, Connecticut, where I am the chairman of the board, we have had to deal with not only George Floyd but Brit and Brianna and Ahmad Arbery. But we've had a, a police shooting right here in Manchester. So mm -hmm. it's closer. It's closer than than Facebook, and it's closer than CNN out here. So I, I'm not sure. I, I'm just making a comment, um, Mr. Harris. Thank you for for bringing up the uh, the stress that's felt by parents, children, and board members. It's a very serious dilemma, and it is something that we have to. Uh, we can't put. We can't bury it under the rug. We have to confront it um directly and we have to be strategic about it because we don't want to make a situation that's already difficult and make it worse however we can't ignore it it's a learning opportunity it's a growth opportunity um and it's a healing opportunity um so that's that's my that's my piece um good morning everyone and thank you for this uh, thoughtful conversation thank you my brother anybody else have any questions well, I want to thank Michelle and Jocelyn. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, certainly understand that if uh, you want to put out some information, resources, or other information, we can certainly put it in the Cave Journal so people can get it. Uh, I know, Michelle, you put in some information in the chat box uh, so people can look there um, while we're on. Um, but I really want to thank you. Uh, there's so much to think about as we, we do try to go back to schools um, in the fall. Um, Patrice, I know you always look for, for best practices and successes. So why don't we have a discussion? We have some time left. Um, and Michelle and Jocelyn, you're very welcome to stay on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michelle and Jocelyn. And uh, I know that the board chair is on the call. What they most would like is for someone to tell them what will be announced at four o'clock today. And unfortunately, that's the one thing we cannot do for you at the moment. Uh, we need to respect the fact that we were able to be on a briefing that the commissioner had this morning with superintendents. And everyone was told that the information we received is embargoed until 4 p.m. today. Uh, we will, however, just for those of you that may have joined the call late, we will be doing a webinar tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. We'll be able to share not only what information um, is being released, but also the context in which that information was developed and, and the plans and protocols. So with that, this is your opportunity, board chairs, to share hopefully a success, um, something that you're, colleagues might adopt as a best practice, whether it be in your planning for return to school in September, uh, whether it be how you're managing your board meetings and community input, or if you have challenges that you wanna share with your colleagues and, and get some of their best thinking about that. So I turn it over to you. John. Uh, this is Eileen Baker, can you hear me? Yes, Eileen, I, I called on John and I'll get to you next. Sure, thank you so much. So this is a sign of the success of our district and a failing of our district. Um, several students, um, some of whom attended Ivy League schools and others who graduated four years ago, so they are now college graduates, have been cooped up like we all have and thinking about what they did and didn't receive from their education in our district, Brantford. They collected over 2,000 signatures among their peers um, and others and made demands on the board to redo our curriculum to more accurately reflect real history and biases and anti-racism um, and the reality of what happened as we are seeing demonstrated by statues of Confederate generals coming down Christopher Columbus in Worcester Square in New Haven heady events. So we're in the process of putting together, we know that this is not something that the schools should be saddled with and or could even hope to address alone. 
So our administration and the board are working together to create a town hall type meeting. Uh, who knows what that's going to look like? It's a shame that it can't be in person or won't likely won't be um, to address those issues. Uh, they have delved deep into our policy manual, into the state law about how you get an item on an agenda. They've been very well informed and done their homework. And I really appreciate and respect the pressure they're putting on us. It's long overdue, but it's another one of those things like, what is the next school year going to look like uh, when we really, really do have important changes to make on a systemic level? So stay tuned. Thanks, John. A, a great example, obviously, of student voice, even after they are no longer actually your students. Yeah, and, exactly. and speaking of student voice, an, an advocate for student voice, Eileen Baker. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I appreciated the conversation today. And actually, you know, student voice in terms of talking about so many different aspects of restorative circles, what's the most sensitive way of bringing these topics um, to the forefront. I know that I don't know that we're doing it yet in Old Saybrook, but I think student advisory teams where they are small enough where you can have those conversations in a safe place um, is an aspect to be able to introduce as well as um, if there's a history or a social studies curriculum team, they can begin to look at their curriculums and see how they can realistically infuse some of the current um, events that have happened across the country and make sure that those events are capitalized on and having healthy conversations um, among students so that they know there's a variance of opinions, but um, many opportunities to be able to address it from a professional perspective because this, and also to communicate with families to know that they are going to be addressing some of these things in schools um, and parents may have some input in that as well. So uh, tumultuous times, but uh, opportune times um, to get into places and spaces for students to be thinking about that maybe never came to the purview. Um, and in terms of what uh, John Prince was saying, Interesting, in Old Saybrook, we actually have a student exit interview with all of our seniors. So it'll be, that's something very valuable that they feel um, they may have been able to receive in high school or when they come back after a year, things that they found that they were not prepared for or were prepared for might be some suggestions for um, boards of education in Connecticut to be thinking about. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eileen. You're welcome. Who else has something they'd like to share? Patrice? Yes. Leonard. Hi. Hi. Good morning. John, to, to your point, I want you to be encouraged. Um, here in Windsor, um, we have a student board rep, and we also have the ability for students can engage the executive committee at any time um, to, to present their concerns. Um, Windsor, we're, we're, we're in the midst of a three, three to five year cycle where we've overhauled our policies as well as our curriculum. And we're developing, we're not buying anything off the shelf. We're not, we're looking at the curriculum as it was and then align it, align it with the Connecticut standards and then add more rigor to that. And the curriculum is only written on the summer. Um, we don't do any curriculum writing during the school year. We want the teachers during the school year focusing on professional development and lesson plans and then being coached up on how to deliver that curriculum. But the curriculum is only written when school is out of session during the summer and is written with the head of the, um, the assistant superintendent of um, curriculum. And she writes it with her department chairs and she writes it with every teacher at every level, depending on what the, the, the actual curriculum they're writing. If it's music, it's a music teacher all the way up. If it's math three, it's math three, and two thirds of the teachers so that there's buy-in from the ground up. And then when it's presented to the board and, and approved by the board, there shouldn't be any, nothing new coming down the pipe. Everybody had buy-in, the whole union had an opportunity to take a look at it. And it's been a very, very seamless process. This is year four of us um, overhauling our curriculum. We're about 70% complete. And we still got a lot more work to do, and they're actually writing right now as we speak. Um, but it's been a very, very smooth process. So 
be encouraged. It's not going to happen overnight. So expect it to happen overnight and um, you're going to be fine. Now that's similar to what we do, but the issue is how white the curriculum is mm -hmm. and how ill-informed it is about all of the issues that we're seeing explode before our eyes today. And they're, they're right on about that. So it's going to be a redo that has a focus that we've neglected for far too long. So yeah, I agree. And that's a very good, good process. Should engage everybody. Thank you for that. Be encouraged, sir. It's very important when board members are able to support each other. Who else has a comment? I do, Pat King. Hi, Pat, go ahead. As you probably have heard, we've had a tragic uh, shooting in town um, last night. And it's one of our junior students who was a star basketball player. And, you know, I, I take some of the comments that were made today and think that, you know, you, they're very helpful. We will have staff in circles and we're trying. The letter has already been sent to parents and staff and students um, regarding counseling. And it's very difficult because you really have to honor the uh, COVID regulations, but we're going to try our best. But if anybody has any suggestions, I'm more than willing to take them in. Thank you. This is going to put a real damper on opening school. We're, we're very sorry for, for the loss, Pat. And um, if people don't have comments that they want to share right now, but want to send uh, Pat messages of support and, and thoughts, do you want to give them your email address, Pat? Sure. It's Pat L. King at Cox.net. Pat L. King at Cox.net. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other final comments? All right, with that and respecting our commitment to try and stick to, to one hour for these board chair check-ins, uh, we hope to be uh, talking to you tomorrow at our 10 a.m. webinar. We will also be doing a webinar probably on Tuesday, once the 50 pages of guidance is released, presumably on Monday from the State Department of Education. Uh, and uh, I'm just hoping they release it before 9 p.m. because it's gonna be a lot of late night reading otherwise. Uh, we will also certainly be talking to you next Thursday at our regular 11 a.m. board chair check-in. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you all. Thanks Patrice. Thanks, Bob. Excellent. Thanks, My condolences. Absolutely, Pat. Thanks, Don.